everybody. And also welcome again to Martin Flenner. Thanks for visiting. So uh, Martin is a Humboldt professor at the University of Ulm, where he's also the director of the Institute for Theoretical Physics and of the recently founded Center for Quantum Biosciences. So thank you very much, Martin, for coming and telling us about us. So you're up to the Ulm. Okay, good. So um, good morning, everybody. Uh, so, uh, Yasser asked me to, to give a lecture which is perhaps a little bit geared towards the application of uh, quantum devices to biology and medicine. And that happens to be a branch of uh, the work that we are doing in our group. And so, therefore, I will concentrate on that particular aspect. Um, uh, it will be one quantum technology that will be useful for that. Um, that oh, well, there are many quantum technologies that are useful for that, but I will concentrate on one of them so that I can actually also explain a little bit the background of that particular quantum technology. And uh, then I will show you what can be done actually with these kind of devices. So what, what can one actually measure in, in biological and medical applications? And, and that's sort of the, the roadmap of the, of the talk. And um, so to, to actually motivate this a little bit, because I mean, uh, just to, as a, by means of introduction, basically, um, I want to tell you briefly about microscopy. Because in the, in the end, what we are doing, to some extent, actually, here is, is going to be microscopy, but a very different kind of to the one that you're knowing already. So. Here, uh, this is so a history of, uh, of microscopy. So this is actually a telescope, in fact. Um, this was not invented by Galileo, but Galileo was one of the earliest ones that took up the technology and then used it for observations uh, of natural phenomena. So it was uh, actually, I think it was, it was originally invented in, in the Netherlands. And uh, so Galileo actually used it to observe uh, astronomical uh, phenomena. For example, he looked at the moon. And uh, so in a way, this was nothing new because we could, can see the moon very well with our eyes. Not a problem. Um, he used the telescope basically to bring it a bit closer and to look in a little bit more detail at the moon. So he saw some craters and, and little mountains and, and stuff like that. So it was very nice, but uh, it was looking at something that we already knew was there. Um, so quite some different uh, approach was actually then done by van Leeuwenhoek, that's a Dutch scientist, and he turned the principle around and rather than looking at distant objects, bringing them a bit closer, he looked at very close objects and made them a bit, bit larger basically. So he actually used basically a microscope and um, he used it to actually discover bacteria. Okay, so here this was a case where he used a new uh, physical technology, namely the control of light by lenses, to discover a biological phenomenon. So in fact, he was the first microbiologist of humanity. Yeah. So nobody had seen before bacteria. Nobody knew that there was anything like that. Yeah. And he discovered that by making use of this physical device. And so this was, at the time, it was an absolute sensation. Uh, he got elected to the Royal Society uh, of, of London and, and all sorts of things. And he was greatly respected, actually. And um, uh, at the time, uh, there was Hook, the guy from Hook's Law, who was, at the time, actually one of the most eminent scientists in England. And that, at that time, meant the world. Um, well, and he sort of said, well, by the help of microscopes, there's nothing so small as to escape by inquiry. So he just thought, OK. And Leuvenhoek did a great job. He achieved a 300-fold magnification. We'll just make better lenses and you know, work a bit on these things. And we can, make, we can see smaller and smaller things. Uh, of course, we know that nowadays that this is not quite the case. There is something like the diffraction limit, for example that uh, prevents these kind of devices from resolving anything that is really much smaller uh, than the optical wavelength. Yeah. And now there are 
metrics around that. Uh, the year before last, I think, or well, last year's uh, whatever, chemistry Nobel Prize was awarded for tricks to try and get around the diffraction limit, but they use quite different uh, methods, actually. So they use also properties of the material that are, is being investigated, while the typical diffraction limit applies really to these kind of devices or lenses and light, and how well can you focus it, basically. And that's what it says. And uh, well, so we know that uh, just using the same light and better lenses will not, uh, will not lead us anywhere. I mean, will lead us a bit farther, but there's a limit. And um, so what people then, 300 years later, did is, well, they went to smaller wavelengths because at the end of the 19th century, very close to the end, in 1895 or something like that, uh, Conrad Röntgen discovered very short wavelength radiation in the X-rays. And, uh, well, short wavelength radiation can allow us to resolve smaller objects. And secondly, um, we now understand, and that was not already understood in the 17th century, that the waves, of course, uh, well, that light uh, or radiation uh, is really wave, so it can show interference. And so in 1914, uh, physicists, again, used this uh, putting these things together, namely X-rays and diffraction, uh, to analyze the crystal structure of materials. Uh, and they discovered, for example, the crystal structure of diamond, uh, coal, and, and all sorts of other things, um, by actually looking really at the, at the diffraction of X-rays from these structures. And this was a direct proof, um, or more direct proof, of the existence of atoms and the existence of crystal lattices. It's also a new phenomenon that you could discover with new uh, physical kind of microscopy techniques. So that has nothing to do with biology. However, the same idea can be used to learn something about biology. Because if you can take biological material and you crystallize it, so like a black proteins, and you can make them arrange in a, in a crystal, uh, then you can actually use the same principles to try and uncover the crystal structure of or the, the structure of those proteins. And this has contributed, well, there are many, many proteins now that have, whose structures have been determined, and maybe the most famous uh, structure um, that was uh, unraveled was that of DNA, and that was greatly helped by the um, X-ray crystallography data that Rosen and Franklin uh, was actually taking. And uh, so that is clearly a biological discovery again. Yeah. And when you look at the protein database, there are millions of structures, and many of them, not all, but many of them have been, de have been determined by these kind of techniques. There are also NMR techniques and various other methods, um, but this was certainly an important one um, to contribute to that. So again, we learned to control a new physical phenomenon. Uh, we learned more about physics, like looking at light in a different way, shorter wavelengths, or using diffraction, using the wave character, we learn something about biology. And this is continuing, of course, well, it should continue. So um, Nowadays, we are using other techniques, it's not, not so much light anymore, it's actually, in this case, nuclear magnetic resonance, which actually really allows us also to determine the structure of s not too large uh, proteins. It's important that the proteins are not so large because they have to actually freely rotate because then a lot of the noise basically and perturbations are averaging out and you can actually really see um, uh, structural issues, namely you will see the resonance frequencies of the nuclei basically and that tells you about structure. Now this is a wonderful method that also delivers a lot of uh, protein structures. Um, but uh, it is limited, and actually all of these methods are limited in a very specific aspect. They do not observe an individual protein or an individual mo molecule or so. They actually need many, 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 like billions, trillions, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 15 molecules to actually get a visible signal from your machine. Okay? So that's... Not a problem if you want to determine the structure of a protein in a particular state, but it is a problem if you want to, for example, um, observe you know, dynamical changes of the structure. Because in an ensemble, not all the molecules will make the transition from, or all the proteins will make the transition from one state to another. 
the same time. And so you will see more or less the average, usually, unless you, you, know, you, you will use a lot of tricks and chemical stuff and so on. Sometimes it is possible, but it's really challenging because you have the ensemble average. So this is something that you would like to overcome. Uh, another thing, actually, uh, that is also a challenge in all this protein structure determination is that there are many proteins, so proteins um, you either have to be able to put them in solution or you have to be able to crystallize them and there are many proteins that don't like to do this so actually a lot of the effort involved in the crystal structure determination of proteins is not so much once it's crystallized determining the structure I mean there are I mean, many standard methods and so on um, it's actually crystallizing it then in the first place. That's often the big, big challenge and very, very difficult. And uh, so an important kind of proteins, membrane proteins that sit in the cell membrane, they are not easy to crystallize, for example. Yeah? Um, and part of the reason is that actually they really form an integral part of the cell membrane. So you cannot just take them out, because if you take them out, they fall apart. Or they at least change their structure very, very, very much. So this is something that uh, is difficult, so you have to keep them in, in a piece of membrane and then you have to try and sort of crystallize that and it seems to be very difficult. People are making progress, but you can see that this is a challenge because again, if you go to the protein database and you look for membrane protein structures, you will only find a few hundred or maybe a thousand or so, but the protein database contains millions of structures. Uh, so this is obviously much harder. Now, uh, unfortunately, on the other hand, these ones are pretty important for, for you because they are in the cell membrane, so that means also they regulate transport of stuff from inside the cell to outside the cell and vice versa. And also they regulate communication between inside the cell and outside of the cell, which is also important. And, um, you know, uh, a large fraction of all medicine that there is, 50%, uh, Supposedly, the numbers differ a little bit. Some people say 30, some people say 70 percent. But you know, a vast fraction of the present uh, medicine is in some form manipulating some membrane protein of a cell, which is not so surprising because you know you don't really want to try and put something into the cell necessarily. Ideally, it's much easier to, to attack the outside of the cell and learn something uh, and, and affect the behavior. And so this is. Um, so it's, under, it's important to understand these kind of creatures. Okay. Right, also, uh, if, um, another way to show you that they are important is, so, I mean, some of the most poisonous animals on the planet, many of them living in Australia, uh, their poisons actually um, affect the operation of certain membrane proteins and or channels, in fact. So, um, and a tiny amount of poison is enough to you know, completely kill you. Um, so often it is not known how these membrane proteins work. Even if you have the structure, you may not have the, all the intermediate structures in their dynamical changes. So it would be really nice to learn more about those. And uh, learning more about those is one of the dreams that the technology that I will present to you now um, may actually deliver. I say may, because this is really a very, very big challenge. But it's a worthwhile goal. And on the way, there will be other things in biology and also quantum technologies that you will actually discover with, uh, and develop with these, with these um, devices. So this is so much for the introduction. So now what, what um, the tech specific quantum technology um, that I will talk about will is promising to deliver is the following. It will deliver a sensor or an imaging agent, and I will explain both aspects in the rest of the talk, which will be able to see individual molecules. So it will not require 10 to the 15 of them. It will see one or signal from one of them. Um, it may achieve uh, atomic resolution, meaning it will be able to, to find out there is one atom and there is a different atom. And so you can see uh, where they are and which atoms they are. So uh, also with chemical sensitivity. Uh, it operates under physiological conditions, which is rather unusual for a, uh, for a quantum technology. So it will work at room temperature. 
um, potentially inside the body. Okay. Um, and it can be made as small as a protein. Um, and that means that you can actually bring it very, very, very close to a protein or even attach it to a protein. And that's actually one of the reasons why you can solve the other parts of the, of the problem. So you can make it small, you can bring it very close to the target that you want to see. And very close, I mean a few nanometers. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the, what the sensor is going to deliver. Uh, that's an electron microscope picture of the sensor. This is four nanometers. Actually, the sensor is a piece of diamond uh, with some tricks inside. And this is actually a particular uh, membrane receptor, which, as you can see, has roughly the same size. Okay. So, if we can do all this, then it certainly provides us a new method to look into small systems. This may help us in biology, in medicine, but also in physics and in nanotechnologies, of course. And just like before, when we, the, the development of microscopy allowed us to learn something about biology, X-ray diffraction allowed us to learn something about biology, NMR, all these new technologies, they always taught us something new about biology, physics, medicine, and so on, because we saw new things that we could not see before. Okay. So, now, now a little bit of quantum physics, actually. Yeah. And uh, so this is, um, this is uh, the material from which uh, the sensor is being made. So this is a diamond, as you can see here. And uh, you can see here this diamond has color. And so now um, you all had solid state physics class at some point, I think. And if, well, I say, if you paid attention or if the, actually the professor was actually teaching it, um, you will know that there's something odd here because diamond has a very, very large optical band gap, five and a half electron volts. That means visible light uh, will not be absorbed. But absorption is a key factor of, of giving color to something. You either see the lack of color going through or you see actually when the color is absorbed, when light is absorbed, it will also be re-emitted. So you see the re-emitted light also. So somehow uh, this is strange because when you go and let's say you go to London at some point, I recommend that you always look for Sotheby's and Christie's um, auctions. Um, because, well, the auction is a bit expensive for all of us in the room. However, the exhibition before is free and you can see what is actually being auctioned off. And so you can see the most fantastic paintings that you see only once in 50 years, because otherwise they are sitting in the room of some living room of some billionaire. Uh, but sometimes they auction off diamonds. And then you can see really perfect diamonds. And really what you see is the reflection, in fact. It's the light from the surfaces from the cuts. Um, otherwise they're really, really transparent, really amazingly transparent. So, you know, this is not what we see here. So something must be different in this material here. And indeed, there is something different. This color is actually coming from defects in the lattice structure. So perfect diamond, in a way, is not very interesting for us. Um, it is the defects that make the diamond actually really interesting. And uh, so there are many, many defects in the lattice, uh, in lattice structure of diamonds. So many hundred, actually that are known, and they are known for a long time already. I mean, people do work because spectroscopy on, on diamonds, and they see these things. And I would like to concentrate on one particular um, defect uh, that happens to be particularly amenable to quantum control. That's why people are looking at it at the moment. There are others that are, people are looking at it, but it doesn't really matter for what I want to explain. Um, this is enough, and this is the most popular one at the moment. So what is it? Actually, so here's the diamond crystal lattice, all the carbons. And then you see here, here's a nitrogen atom that has replaced the carbon atom. Okay? So that's one ingredient in this defect. And then next to it, in a neighboring lattice site, another carbon atom has been knocked out and there's just nothing. There's an empty space now. So this is called the nitrogen vacancy center. And that actually gives rise to that color um, at the right concentration. If there are too many of them, it becomes darker and so on. But 
uh, this gives color, and this means actually this defect absorbs light and it re-emits it. And it, uh, it absorbs light around 630 nanometers, roughly, and it uh, and re emits it at a band between 600 nan 630 nanometers and around 800 or so. Um, right. So that's that's great. That's already a useful uh, thing in itself, as we will see a moment a little bit later. So you have here a diamond which has atomic size defects that absorb and emit light. So you can make a very, very small diamond, a few nanometers in size. If it has one of these defects, you shine a laser light on it, then it will actually scatter 10 to the 7 photons per second. That's roughly as much as a quantum dot. And so you will be able to see it. Yeah. So in a microscope, maybe not with a pure eye, but in a microscope you can see it. So that already is, is an interesting way of tracking where these little diamonds actually might go in the cell. But uh, for what we want to do, this is not good enough. I mean, if it was just that, um, the talk would stop now and it would be a little bit of optical observation, but not really very interesting, not very exciting. Now, we have to look at the electronic structure of, of this little defect here. So, what we have is here, we have here, I mean, there, there are sort of electrons that would like to, would normally have liked to pair with another set of electrons of a carbon atom here, so they are dangling bonds here. So these electrons are not paired. Okay, so now we have to look at the uh, electron structure, and when you look at this actually, uh, you see that there are things like this, there are five electrons that are sort of free. Now the interesting defect is actually a negatively charged one where there's another electron sitting on it, and then there are six electron spins. And it turns out that four of them form singlets, and you can't see them, basically. And two of them, they form a spin one, half, a spin one system, so their spins add up. Okay? So that's another nice observation. So not only can we shine light on it, but this system also contains an electron spin, uh, a spin one, basically, in the ground state. So that's another degree of freedom. That's actually really our quantum mechanical degree of freedom that is going to be used uh, in the rest of the talk. And uh, well, what is, what, what is useful about that? Well, if you look at it, so it's a spin one. So you have the m equals one state here and the m equals plus and minus one state. They are shifted upwards because you can imagine, I mean, hand waving the reason is you have two electrons and they are somehow interacting with each other. And so this leads of course to shifts depending on whether the electron spins are parallel or anti-parallel. And that explains why there is actually a gap of about 2.8 kilo gigahertz here. And so you have the plus and minus one state here and this n equals zero state here. And now you all know from atomic physics the Zeeman effect. You apply a magnetic field to an atom, the energy levels, the magnetic energy levels shift. Yeah? So this is actually in atomic physics this is used to, for example, you can use, use it to measure magnetic fields. And here we can do the same. So this system, when it's subjected to a magnetic field, well, what will happen is that the, this energy splitting between plus one and minus one will change, will actually grow. And also the splitting between n equals zero and the upper two ones will change. Okay? So you can immediately see that what we have here is a little compass needle, so to speak, a little magnetometer. And that alone would also not be very helpful if we could not read it, if we would have no means to read it out. What do you do in atomic physics? Well, you shine light and you scatter light on the atoms and you learn something about the electronic transitions. You do the same here. So it's a combination of this electronic degree of freedom and the fact that you can scatter light off this system and that the light scattering depends on the state of the electron spin. That is the combination that really makes this useful. And why does it depend on the state of the electron spin? Well, we have selection rules. So if you are in the m equals zero state, you can only jump to certain other m equal m states. So for example, not to m equals zero again, but m equals plus one or minus one, for example, when you use light. So you have a difference in scattering of light depending <coughs> on what magnetic uh, sublevel you are in. And so that way, shining light, and then you look how much resonance fluorescence there is, teaches you something about which magnetic sublevel you were in. Actually. So that's the basic idea. 
and that's called optically detected magnetic resonance. Okay, and um, right. So what can you do with this? You can sense magnetic fields, for example, and so you can ask the question whether it might be possible that this magnetic field sensor is sufficiently sensitive to see a magnetic field that is generated by a single electron or a single um, 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 atomic nucleus. Yeah. Now these are small, these are very small magnetic fields and clearly when the se spatial separation between this defect and the spin that you want to see is large and large actually means already microns is large then you will not be able to see anything. You will only be able to see these tiny, tiny fields when you come very, very close. Within a few nanometers, the field generated by an electron spin is actually not so small anymore. It's in the, broadly in the range, and it depends precisely on the distance, of course, broadly in the range of micro Tesla. That's actually not such a small quantity altogether. And so there might be hope, in fact, that you can really see magnetic fields of individual spins. If you can do that, then you can, dis and you can discriminate between different spins, you can discriminate between different atoms. You may even be able to see precisely where the atom is. So you can do what NMR spectroscopy does with 10 to the 15 atoms, uh, with the 10 to the 15 proteins, you might be able to do by observing individual proteins and their intrinsic nuclear spins. So I'll come and explain this in a little bit more detail, but that's one of the uh, uh, approaches, one, I, one, thing, one of the things that one may measure. And the problem is that, especially in biology, of course, you don't only have the desired signal, you have all sorts of dirt around it. I mean, a biological system is not only one single protein, there's water around it, there's all sorts of other things, so there will be a lot of noise that you also have to deal with, and this noise makes, in a way, makes your compost needle uncertain, and you lose your sensitivity. So you will have to either clean up the target to remove everything that you do not want to see, and it causes noise. But if you do that, you almost certainly change the biology of the system. So if you do not want to clean up the system, then what you have to do is you have to find, like what we call them, software tricks, clever measurement schemes to make your sensor insensitive to the noise while retaining its sensitivity to the signal that you want to see. And how to do that, I will explain you. At least I will explain you a principle of that. Yeah. And that's really, that's now pure quantum mechanics that will be done. I mean, it's really quantum optics tricks, a bit of solid state, a bit of NMR tricks, put together, make a quantum technology, and then with these tricks, one can then apply it to study biological systems or many other physical phenomena as well. Okay, so now uh, this looks a little bit complicated. So this is the Hamiltonian of the spin system in the ground state of this NV defect. Okay, and I've written it down. Uh, so here this is magnetic fields. Here these are the spin operators of the electron spin. These are actually nuclear spins. You can actually forget about those. Um, so this looks rather complicated, so that's the full, full Hamiltonian. So you do not need to memorize that, obviously. Yes. Um, but what I want to show you is that actually you cannot only see magnetic fields. You can see many things. So in principle, this Hamiltonian will change its eigenvalues when you change the magnetic field, for example. That's this part here. Yeah. Make the magnetic field large, then the level splitting grows and, all, and these sort of things. So that's governed by this part of the Hamiltonian. But there are more things here. Actually, you remove this, and I have an electric field, then also it turns out that the spin levels will change. This is not the Zeeman effect. It is actually something different, because when you apply an electric field, the crystal structure and also the electron wave functions, I mean, they are charges, though they are pulled a little bit in different directions, and that changes the energy splitting of the magnetic quantum numbers because the average distance between the two spin electron spins that make up the spin one system changes a little bit, for example. So that actually also leads to a, a change of the energy level structure, and you can read this out by light. It's actually a smaller effect, so it's it's I mean you can imagine, I mean it's not quite so not quite as direct as the magnetic field, so it's a smaller effect. 
Now, interestingly, you see this is the electric field. There's another term here. That is also an interesting term. It's related to the same phenomenon. Um, so I'll remove that and put this here. So this is a so-called strain term. So if I take the diamond and I press it, then I induce strain on the lattice. Yeah? So I mean pressure, basically. I change the lattice structure just a little bit. That will change the distribution of the electron wave function. And therefore, again, the magnetic sublevels will change. Yeah, the splitting will change. Actually, it's the same, I mean, it, uh, it appears in the same parts of the Hamiltonian as the electric field, because in the end, it's really the same effect. Okay? So that means you can measure strain, you can measure pressure and forces. And then finally, uh, one thing that I had to add in afterwards, because I noticed that it was not in there, there's another thing that you can measure, namely temperature. So if you apply temperature, the atoms will um, juggle around a little bit more, the average distance again changes. This leads again to a change in magnetic sublevels. So you see that it's not only magnetic field, it's all sorts of physical observables. They all have an effect on the crystal structure of the diamond, which acts back onto the electronic magnetic sublevels. And that is then what we can read out. Okay. So this is, uh, this is sort of basically, that's the basic underlying physics. I mean, this Hamiltonian is the one that we permanently use to describe the dynamics of the system, or at least it's, it's a one ingredient, and all sorts of other things to describe the noise and all these, these other phenomena uh, will also be added in. But this really explains why we can measure so many things uh, with the dynamics. And the same thing with many of these things, uh, would also happen in other materials with other defects. This is not specific to the MD center at all. Any defect that has an optical transition and has some electron spin in the ground state will be useful for measuring um, all these quantities, actually. Yeah. Okay, so, fine. So actually, I would like to, because I don't know exactly how much uh, quantum optics you remember, so I just want to answer one question that might be in your mind, um, namely, how do I actually measure these energy differences? I mean, in the end, I, can, I told you by scattering light, I can determine in which magnetic sublevels I am. But this doesn't tell you about the energy splitting so far. So somehow we want to find out that. And uh, this is typically done by a method called Ramsey spectroscopy. Um, and it, the principle is the following. So imagine this is a spin. So initially it's pointing upwards in the z direction. Okay. And um, now what, the first step I always do is I apply a pi half pulse. I rotate it by 90 degrees such that it's in the xy plane. So now if there is a magnetic field in the z direction, then this spin will start to precess around the z axis. And the speed at which it processes is directly related to the energy difference between spin up and spin down. Yeah. OK, so then we wait a little bit and we allow it to process. And then after a while, we make another pi half pulse. And now, well, OK, so now it depends really what, what happens. So here, uh, the pi half pulse makes a rotation around this axis, moving from the z to the x in this case. Now, the spin had precess from the x to the y axis, so rotation of the y axis doesn't make any difference now. It's still in the same state. And now, we measure actually whether the spin is up or down. So here we will get a signal that in 50% of the cases we will find spin up, in 50% of the cases we will find spin down. Fine. Now we could repeat this experiment, now we have a slightly different magnetic field. So, pi pulse, pi half pulse, bit of free rotation, but now the field was maybe larger or we waited longer, one of the two things. So the spin actually has rotated a bit more. Now the second pulse comes and the spin is now pointing upwards. So now we get a different signal. So by, by having a few pulses and by measuring populations, we can actually learn something about the speed at which, uh, or the frequency at which the spin is processing, which in turn tells us about something about the energy difference. So that's the thing here. And if you go through the analysis, you will see actually that this, the probability of finding the spin up in such a scheme is 1 plus the cosine of the frequency at which it's processing 
multiplied by the time the separation of these two pulses divided by two. That's actually a little exercise that you can easily check yourself. Um, so you see, depending either you if you keep the time fixed, then this tells you about the, va the variation, and this probability tells you about changes in this frequency. Yeah. So that's what you want to do. Um, now there's a problem here. If you have noise, actually the formula looks like that. If you have dephasing noise, for example, then actually this oscillating factor is sort of suppressed by e to the minus gamma t, where gamma is a dephasing rate. And that's not surprising. If you have dephasing noise, it randomizes the phase, and you should not really be able to learn anything about uh, coherent rotation anymore. And so this uh, becomes very problematic very quickly in, in solid state physics phenomena like this MV center and diamond and biological systems because there's a lot of this noise around. So this drops off very quickly. So this is what we really have to fight with. OK. So, now I want to tell you, I want to explain to you how we can get rid of this, uh, can get rid, get rid of noise, and also how we can get rid of noise in such a way that we retain sensitivity to a desired signal. Okay. So, and to explain that, so let's actually um, consider really the level structure of this, of this defect. And we assume that we have applied already some magnetic field externally in the experiment. So the experiment was actually when they use this defect, they always apply an external magnetic field along the direction of this particular defect. And when they do that, well, this level and that level split, so you really have a two-level system here. And what you want to know in the end is the energy difference between this level and that level, because it tells you something about uh, the strength of various magnetic fields that might, might apply to the system. At the same time, you have magnetic noise that will jiggle around this state, it will push it up and down depending if the magnetic field fluctuates, this level will fluctuate, so it will make your uh, level spacing a bit uncertain. Okay, so now, what could one do with this? So for that, I didn't manage to draw anything, so I'll show it by my by hands. So now, I want to show you how in a specific situation we can actually completely get rid of this defacing noise. Um, and we are making use of a property of the environment that is often true, but not always. But in, this, in these systems, it's often true. The environment is actually itself not really creating white noise that is sort of, you know, has no memory, and it's very broad in frequency. But actually, the fluctuations are rather slow. So that means that the configuration of the environment, looking at one moment, is almost the same if you look a nanosecond later, for example. So the environment changes a bit more, relatively slow. So, now, this is enough for us to invent schemes to protect against noise. So, how would this work? So, imagine the following. So, I have a spin at the, mo at the beginning that's pointing upwards. And now, let's imagine that the, um, that the environment has the effect that it pushes the, the spin off the z-axis in one particular direction. So for example, in this direction. So we do not actually need to know which direction it is really is. We only need to know that a short time later, the environment will want to do the same thing. It will push further in this direction. Okay? So now, what can we do? So we start here. The environment pushes in this direction. So now, I make a rotation around the z-axis by pi. And now the environment does the same thing. It pushes again. So oop, the spin is up again. So actually, the environment, by introducing this pi phase shift, we actually have cancelled out the effect of the environment. Okay? This works better when the pi pulse happens after a very short time. The shorter the time that we need to implement the pi pulse, the better, because then the environment really does precisely, uh, uh, well, more closely the same thing as it did in the first step because it had no ch time to change its configuration. So that's important. Now that's the observation. It did not matter actually in which direction the magnetic, uh, the, the, the environment was pushing the spin. Any direction would have been fine. I would have made my pi rotation, which is always the same, and then the environment would have restored the state of the system. Okay? So, I did not need to know what the environment does, I only needed to know that it does the same thing all the time. That's a trick. 
And so this is not something that we invented. This is 60 years old by now. This is what NMR people <coughs> use to stabilize their systems. So we actually apply a train of pi pulses, um, which effectively average out the action of the environment. Of course, what the way I explained it was, if I have a really a stationary environment, then one pi pulse is enough. If the environment changes on a certain time scale, I need to not use more pi pulses that are spaced by less than the characteristic time scale of the change of the environment. So, the shorter the memory time of the environment, so the more white, the closer it resembles white noise, the more frequent my pi pulses have to be. But it's always the same trick. Now, this is the basic idea that it's not necessarily the best to make them equally spaced and you can now invent all sorts of tricks and, and optimize those pulses, but that's the basic idea. Yeah. Now, actually, now going further with this is not quite so straightforward. And there's actually uh, uh, another method, almost the same, which also uses radiation that you shine in. And it takes its inspiration from the observation that, well, here we started with a few pulses spaced by a large amount. Now we have more pulses spaced by less. And we could push this further and further. At some point, you would really not see the gaps in between the pulses anymore. So why not, from the beginning, distribute the energy uniformly over the time interval? So have, instead, a continuous driving field. Yeah. Would that also work? So that's not entirely obvious, actually. right? Um, but now this is what I explain you next. That also does the trick, actually. From a practical point of view, this is useful because it turns out it uses less energy than the other schemes. But that's not obvious. Okay. So now, how does this work? Well, now this is again, now we really use quantum optics. So um, if you have a two-level system here, and now I really drive this two-level system here on resonance, with a constant field. Okay, so that's what I'm doing now. And I'm trying to protect against the um, influence of the environment. Well, to understand why this might indeed work, actually, you do what every self-respecting quantum optician would do in this situation. He takes this system, it's a two-level system with a constant driving field, you diagonalize uh, the Hamiltonian. Because the Hamiltonian really, in the end, in the matrix form, it will look like basically something like, well, actually, it will look like um, this. So here you have Rabi frequencies that make transitions between the ground state, zero, and the upper state, plus one. And here you have the diagonal terms. So this can be diagonalized. It has two eigenstates. These eigenstates are plus and minus one. They are zero, plus, minus plus one state divided by two, and the eigenvalues are plus minus omega. So that's, I mean, you take a matrix, diagonalize it, that's what you get. So let's have a look at those eigenstates instead, because that will be a much nicer picture to understand what's going on. So these are the eigenstates here, so zero plus one and zero minus one, and they have an energy splitting, because that has energy plus omega, that has energy minus omega, so this one has more energy, this one has less energy. Okay. Now, what is the noise that we're having here? So this is changing the energy separation. Yeah. So if the energy separation changes, we have a change in frequency integrated over time that gives a change in phase. So actually we have a random phase between the lower state and the upper state. So random phase changes we have. Yeah. So if we want to make a random phase change, what we see here is this eigenstate has a fixed phase, plus one. This one has a fixed phase, minus one. Okay. So if I want to change the phase, relative phase, I go actually from this state to that state, or I go from this state to that state. Now, in doing so, I either need to provide the energy difference, or I need to get rid of the energy difference. So if I want to go from here to here, someone has to give me the energy difference, otherwise energy conservation forbids this process. 
And if I want to drop from here to here, I have to have some way to get rid of the energy difference. I have to excite something else. Okay? So, where can this come from? Well, we have this quantum system and we have the environment that creates noise. So in the environment we have the fluctuations uh, of the magnetic field, and these two energy level fluctuations here, and they happen at different frequencies. And so this comes, for example, from a bunch of harmonic oscillators that are jiggling about. So, if in the environment there is some system that can provide this energy difference or can accept it, that means if the environment has a frequency component that is equal to this energy di frequency difference or energy difference here, then you can have these transitions. If, however, this is not present in the environment, then you will not have these transitions. So, if my environment changes very slowly, then if you look at the Fourier transform of its evolution, you will see that it only has very low frequencies. So all the frequencies in the system are very small. Okay, so in a slow environment, what I have to do is I have to drive the system so hard that the energy levels here are split by more than all the typical frequencies in the environment. And if you do that, then there's no fluctuator in the environment that, has, that fluctuates at the right frequency or can accept and therefore cannot give the energy or cannot accept the energy. And therefore, you will stop having these transitions by energy conservation. So that's really the basic idea. Okay. Now, that's nice. So that means if you have an environment with a certain frequency spectrum, you drive harder than the width of the frequency spectrum and your system becomes stable. Now, this also means, of course, that you have a little bit of a problem now because now you have decoupled your sensor mm -hmm. your system here from everything in the environment, the, the, the noise, but also, quite likely, from the signal, actually. So you have to do one additional thing to single out the system, the, the signal. Well, I told you already we have a magnetic field applied here, and we can change this. This is applied by a static, I mean, some, some, some magnet, basically, and it's held a very uh, well, uh, stable value, but it can be changed by the experimenter by changing the dial. So this means that in this magnetic field, an electron spin or a nuclear spin, for example, will have an energy difference between spin up and spin down. Now, if we make sure that this energy difference of this, of this spin up and spin down of this nuclear spin or electron spin in the environment equals this energy splitting here, then these two systems can exchange energy because they are resonant and energy conservation is observed. And at the same time, if the environment still has all its frequencies here, the environment will not create any of these transitions. So, on the one hand, we have to drive our sensor sufficiently hard so that it's outside this frequency spectrum and we have to apply an external magnetic field that is sufficiently large such that the spin that we want to see has an energy splitting that is also outside of this you know, fluctuation spectrum of the environment. Then you can see the target spin that you want to see, but you do not see the environment. So that's the basic idea that underlies this sensing scheme. This applies for magnetic fields, but it applies also for these other quantities that I mentioned, electric fields always the same thing. And so when we have this situation, then really we can start and by preparing our sensor, for example, in this state if you want to. And if, let's say, a nuclear spin is in the spin-up state, then they can exchange energy and they will flip-flop back and forth. So the nuclear spin will go down, our sensor spin will go to the upper level. And then they go back and forth like this. Okay? So we can see that they start to exchange energy. So we, if, they, if we see, if our sensor starts to see it loses population here and moves up here, that must come from some signal from the outside, and the rate at which this is happening will tell us something about the interaction strength between the target and the sensor. And we know the law, because it's, these are dipoles, electric dipoles, so this is dipolar interaction, so we know the distance dependence and the orientational dependence. And therefore, from this, we can find out where the spin is sitting, so how far and in which place it is actually sitting. Yeah. So at least in principle. So this is uh, 
I mean, firstly, this is on a sheet of paper, like, I mean, this was calculated in some detail here. But you see the principle now. Okay. Now, well, let's, let's just leave out this. This is a nice trick. I mean, I will, I'm happy to give you the slides afterwards. You can uh, look at it. Um, but it's not so essential now for the, for the next thing. This is basically tricks of how to improve the scheme even further. And to be honest, um, when you understand the principle, you can find out these, 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 you can easily understand the papers and also maybe find out the tricks themselves. But here I want to show you a little calculation and an experiment, which actually takes this basic idea and puts it into action. So actually, this experiment has measured the position of a single nuclear spring by seeing its magnetic field. And it uses exactly the protocol that I've shown you. Now, the distance was a rather unexciting five angstrom. It was actually a carbon-13 spin inside of the diamond lattice, very, very close to the uh, actual MV center. But it was a demonstration of the first principle uh, that this might actually work. The theory has actually calculated that this should also work over a distance of 5 nanometers and in a moment I will show you experimental results for a, for a distance of 2 nanometers where the spin is actually outside of the planet. But the basic idea of the theoretical calculation was that you take for example phosphoric acid and you want to see the phosphorus up in here. So the experiment first would change the orientation of the magnetic field because that affects the interaction strength between the MV center and the nuclear spin because the hyperfine interaction depends on the relative orientation of the magnetic field and the vector joining uh, from, from the MV center to the nucleus. So we change the orientation and we just look how quickly is energy exchanged and we look for the orientation such that the energy exchange is most rapid. That's here, for example. That will actually give us the direction in which the nuclear spin is sitting. And then at that point here, we measure the rate of energy exchange, and that tells us the distance. Yeah? And so this is the kind of signal that you will, would get from an experiment. And exactly this, well, but with a spin that is much closer, uh, was carried out in this experiment here. This was done in Ulm, actually, in the experimental group of Fyodor Zeletsko, and the theory that came from basically from our group and mainly Germany Tsai has actually done all these calculations. Um, and so this was able to measure the nuclear spin position. And we had a, this was nice because we could actually really check how well the method works because we know where the nuclear spin is sitting. It must be sitting on a lattice site. There are no defects in that. Uh, I mean, there are no sort of really deformations, big deformations on the lattice. So we measured, we identified the position. And then we looked, actually, does it match a lattice site? And the answer was yes, to very, good, very, very good precision. It fitted a lattice site that was the next nearest neighbor, basically. And so this was a directly also confirmation that the method works reasonably well with, in fact, atomic scale resolution. But of course, five angstrom is not very far away. OK, so here, this is a more challenging experiment, but doing basically the same thing. And so this was here a piece of diamond that was grown very high quality diamond. And then there was an NV center that is only two nanometers below the surface. So, and then we needed spins on the outside that we want to measure. And so what our experimentalist friends did is they basically drizzled some sand on the surface. So they took quartz, silicon dioxide. And silicon dioxide has, well, oxygen that has no nuclear spin. Silicon 28, 97% roughly or 96%, that has also no nuclear spin. And then there is about 4% or so silicon-29, and silicon-29 is a spin one-half system, so it has a nuclear spin. And so because there is very few, so there's really a very small number of nuclear spins here on the surface, and then the experiment looked for them. And it was able to find those nuclear spins, it could see them, it had the sensitivity to see individual ones, in principle, Unfortunately, there were five or six, so we could not see a, a single one really, but we could show that the sensitivity was enough to count uh, the number of spins. We could find out which spin it is, because we know the magnetic moment of silicon. If we change the magnetic field and strength, then 
energy splitting between spin up and spin down changes, and it changes in a characteristic way. And from from the basically from the change of the energy splitting, we can infer that it was really silicon that we were seeing. And so this is already much better now. So now imagine, push this further, much harder of course, have the same system and put a protein in here. And now you can start to think of saying, okay, I have a protein and now I will look for the individual nuclei in the protein and find out where they are. And if I do that, then I can infer the structure of the protein. Okay? So that's still some way away, this is not easy. <laughs> Um, but you can see that the first experiment, 2013, five Armstrong distance, now it's two nanometers difference, it's four times as far, and four times as far means 64 times weaker interaction, because dipolar interaction goes like one of our cube. So this is actually it was quite hard. So you need to go a little bit further, I mean maybe five nanometers, and then you're already in the business. Yeah? That is another factor of 10 reduction in signal strength, so this is not going to be easy. Right, so this is physics, this is quantum, this is really, I mean, you don't need to talk about biology, this is quantum technology, this is quantum sensor. Okay, so now I want to point out one very, very important difference of this compared to NMR. Yeah, this is a very important difference. So NMR actually looks at a whole ensemble of spins, very, very, very many, 10 to the 15 of them. And it does so by having a huge magnet, makes 10 or 15 Tesla field or so, has a very tiny um, 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 probe container where you have the 10 to the 15 uh, spins. And then somewhere here is actually a coil uh, that measures the magnetic signal from this little container. So the coil that measures is actually far away from the, from the subject of measurement. So that, that's one of the reasons. The distance is one of the reasons that you know you might need many, many spins. Because you have to compensate the smallness of the field by the largeness of the number of spins. But you have a problem, you actually collect the problem in that way. Because the interaction of each individual spin with this coil here is very weak. Actually, it's much weaker than the interaction of this spin with its neighbor. So these ones will actually permanently exchange their excitations. They will do this all the time, very rapidly, compared to the interaction here. So you actually have an averaging. And so the only thing that this device actually sees is the average magnetization of this nuclear spin ensemble. And that's actually very small, because the energy difference is so small at any reasonable temperature, this is almost precisely 50% up and 50% down, there's almost no magnetization. In fact, at room temperature, in a, I think in a 10 Tesla field, out of every 100,000 spin, well, every 100,000 spins, let's say, pointing up, no, pointing down, 100,000 spins pointing down, 99,999 are pointing up. There's a difference of 1 in 100,000. So you lose a lot of signal because of that, too. So that's the standard NMR setting. So the distance and the fact that you have these random flip-flops, they really force you to use so, so many of the nuclear spins. Now here the situation is different. Here we are really in this extreme. Here we have our sensor very close, so that helps us to increase the signal because the magnetic field is, is, is larger. And also the interaction of this electron spin, which is in the MD center, with these nuclear spins, this direct interaction is actually of the order, or in fact larger, than the interaction between the nuclear spins. So now the nuclear spins don't really flip-flop fast enough to average out the interaction between this spin and that spin. And now you do not see only the net polarization, you actually see for each nuclear spin you get a full unit of signal. So you measure whether this one is up or down, you measure whether this one is up, and up or down, and each one of them gives you a signal. So these are the two things that make a big difference here. One is the distance, that's totally obvious, 
And the other is that it's a different kind of detection regime where the detector interacts strongly with the target, more strongly than the target is interacting internally. So this is very important. And that allows us to make really observations of single spins. Okay. So that's the dream here, you know, having an MV center, put proteins on top and make measurements. Now, um, you have to watch out for a lot of things. Actually, the laser that you shine in here to read out is quite intense. It's a megawatt per square centimeter. Not every protein likes that. You need microwaves. Uh, and actually, the microwave frequencies that you're using are roughly the ones that you use, you use in your microwave oven in the kitchen. That's also not every protein likes that. So, you know, one will have to be very careful with the kind of intensities that one is using. One has to optimize the schemes. And one has to see whether it's really going to be possible to do all this without significantly perturbing the protein. But I think it's a worthwhile goal to go for that and try and see these kind of things. And this is a new quantum technologies that would then lead to new insights in biology. Okay? The other way would be to take actually a live cell and the cell membrane and attach to the, to let's say, a receptor in the cell membrane a nanometer sized diamond here and then use this diamond to observe the immediate vicinity of the receptor. Now, this is also not trivial, yeah? um, but there are first steps that are being done in Ulm to do so, and it's, uh, it has nothing that says this is going to be impossible. And that would be really nice, because then you would have an, in the living being, potentially, an observation of a receptor, and you could ask yourself questions like, here you have the receptor without any signal coming in. Then a drug molecule, for example, is coming. It enters the receptor, and the receptor will react to it. It will change, actually, its shape, usually. And you might be able to see this shape change live, so to speak, using this diamond that is attached to the receptor. So that would be something that is extremely hard to do with traditional technology, observing you know, dynamical phenomena. Right, well, if you want to know more about this, this is a little review that will soon be coming out in Angewandte Chemie. It's my first article in the chemistry journal, actually, um, uh, which explains a little bit potential applications of, of this device, and not only what I've told you so far, but also some of the things that I will tell you about now. Because we have also now applied these principles to in a way, develop a new blood test. I mean, so that's for selling it, basically. <laughs> um, so what we are, have done here is actually, we have set ourselves the task to use such a diamond sensor to detect the presence or absence of proteins in the body, namely ferritin. And ferritin is a very important uh, protein in your, in your bloodstream, for example because it stores iron. I, free iron is not so healthy for you in, in, if it's in the body. So the, the nature had to invent schemes for storing the iron and transporting it from place to place. But on the other hand, you need iron to be healthy. If you, if you lack iron, you have anemia, and you know, you don't, you're not very healthy. And so blood tests actually are looking for um, ferritin um, proteins, for example. And often they merely count them. They don't look inside. Um, so what we wanted to do is actually, we wanted to see, can we actually see individual ferritin molecules? And in principle, would it also be possible to actually find out what's inside and how much iron is actually inside? Because that is important, because you may actually have the right number of ferritins, but they might not be completely filled. That would be unhealthy. Or they are filled with the wrong stuff like aluminum, for example. There are indications that when in the early stages of Alzheimer, ferritin is actually also beginning to be populated by aluminum. So seeing that would be nice. But for that, it's not enough to just count how many there are. You have to be able to see inside. So you have to use somehow spin sensing to distinguish whether it's iron or aluminum or something else. Okay. And so for that, uh, we use actually a little trick um, again, it's a very similar principle, except that now we use noise as the signal. 
we are not looking directly, we are not sort of looking uh, to measure precisely what the phase is. We look how rapidly it is decaying in time. What is the phase coherence time? Why does this help us? Well, if we have here our little sensor and we know that it's very sensitive to noise, magnetic field noise, fluctuating magnetic fields, we'll randomize our phase and lose our phase coherence. So, if I have come with a ferritin and I put it very close, so ferritin contains about 4,500 ions. They have electron spin. They are flip-flopping around. They create, actually, a random magnetic field. So, by looking at the coherence time and lifetime of the electron spin of the EMV center, I can infer the presence or absence of ferritin proteins on the surface of the diamond. And if I know the surface of the diamond and I know the loading factor, I can also infer how many ion is actually inside the uh, inside the um, inside the ferritin, and so we did this as an experiment. So this is a nano diamond, 20 nanometers in diameter, roughly, and this contains actually somewhere you can't see it an MV center, and the MV center will be interrogated with microwaves and, and laser light and so on. And here you see these blobs here; those are actually ferritin proteins. They are sitting on the surface. And now, basically, what was done is one has these NV centers, and first one make, takes a clean diamond. Oh, these their diamonds are first cleaned, they're really nicely pristine on the surface. And we use the standard techniques to measure the coherence time and the lifetime of this electron spin in the NV center. Yeah, we just make standard measurement. And, well, not all the diamonds are identical, so we get this red distribution. So, this is the lifetime. So when you start in a spin zero, how long does it take to go to spin one, for example? And this is the coherence time, so we prepare a coherence superposition of zero and plus one, and we look how long it takes until the relative phase has completely randomized. And, well, you see some time scales, they are here there are 50 microseconds roughly for the T1 time, and about eight or so for the T2 time. Then one took the same batch of diamonds, and now I mixed them with ferritin and waited a while, did some chemical tricks and then ferritin was sticking on the surface and then we were measuring again T1 time, lifetime and coherence time and we get the blue curves so they're completely shifted and actually then you do some modeling and you really can show that this entire shift is explained by the presence of ferritin molecules so one can actually really reproduce the statistics that we see here because it's all a bit of a random process. Sometimes you have here like six, sometimes you have 12 ferritin, so sometimes more, sometimes less. But you can put the statistics and you actually really can uh, reproduce these results. So this tells you about basically that we can see individual proteins. Now, this is uh, interesting because now if, if I would have just one ferritin here, then uh, the measurement of, the, of, the, of these coherence times would tell us how big the magnetic field fluctuations are and that means it tells us how big well, the magnetic field altogether is that means how many ion, is, how much ion is actually inside the ferritin because the more ion, the larger the amplitude of the fluctuations and so the larger the noise. So this is a potential in the end to really look inside of the ferritin cage without really uh, destroying it. Okay. So this was actually work that was done together with chemists also. It was, I mean, the laser stuff was done by Fyodor Zuletsko in this group. The chemistry was done by Tanya Weil, which who is a chemistry professor in our university, and the theory came from this. Right. Now, same principles you may actually also be using, and this is a proposal by the Hollenberg group in Australia, the same kind of principle you could imagine to use to measure actually the current that goes through a membrane channel in the cell membrane. So these are very important. So the fact that I can use my arm actually depends very strongly on the fact that nerve cells can transmit signals and they also need to be able 
to equilibrate sort of voltages and so on again. So they have to be able to shuffle in and out ions. And uh, this is done by ion channels. Okay? And they shuffle around about 10 to the 8 ions per second. And it's not actually easy. I mean, this is not a very large current. It's 10 to the minus 11 ampere. It's very small. And of course, also these ones are very, very small. So there is a technique for measuring these things. It's called the patch clamp technique, where they have a pipette basically that goes here, and then there's some liquid in there, and then they connect it to some electronics to measure the, the currents. Actually, this was a big achievement, got a Nobel Prize in 25 years ago or so. Um, and that's great, but of course it's kind of a bit disruptive and it's limited in the sensing precision. You could imagine taking a diamond and bringing it very close to the ion channel, and now you have ions, a current going through at random rate. So that means you will get some noise from the spins and the charges that are going through the ion channel, and this is what you might be able to measure and read out with the MB center. And now there's no touching anymore. You don't need to attach the pipette and all these sort of things and put some, some fluid and, and stuff. You just put the diamond and shine light and read out. So this is, this has not been done, yeah, this is challenging, but it shows you another sort of potential for this little quantum sensor here to teach you something about dynamical behavior in a biological system. Okay. So another thing that can be done, and it uses the same principles, we measure in the end the change in the magnetic sublevels due to temperature. And then, of course, initially you would say, well, okay, who knows what temperature change you can measure. Actually, you can measure to a, well, temperature uncertainty of, I think, 15 millikelvin per square root hertz. So you measure one second, you can determine temperature to within 15 millikelvin. That's not bad. Because also it's interesting because it's really at a very, very local scale. So an experiment that was done by a looking group is the following. So they put here, here's a diamond, this one, yeah. that is going to be used, well, there's actually one here and one here. They're going to be used for temperature measurements in a cell. And then they also inserted a gold nanoparticle into the cell. And it's sitting, sitting a bit away, it's sitting here. You can shine light onto the gold nanoparticle and heat it up. Okay. So they split this, they shine a laser pulse here, they heat up the gold nanoparticles. And then they make me temperature measurements here to determine the heat, cha heat change. And uh, this worked pretty well um, for a first demonstration. <coughs> and uh, so here, I mean, there are many technologies for measuring temperature. This is the current experiment. And they hope actually to go here. So as good as bulk time, which is, um, has a pretty good uh, temperature um, accuracy. And very, very small in size, 100 nanometers maybe, so much smaller than many other measurement devices. So this is, again, we, we are using the electronic quantum properties of this defect to measure a physical observable, in this case, temperature. So this was, as I said, done by the Looking Group and also by the Wachtrud Group in, in Stuttgart. And another thing that you can do, that I also want to uh, mention briefly is, and I told you already, you can measure strain. So strain means that you distort the lattice structure and that is happening when you exert pressure onto the diamond. So pressure is the same as force. So you have a force sensor here. And in fact, um, as such, actually, the diamond is not a particularly good force sensor at all. And that's absolutely obvious from the beginning because if I exert pressure on a diamond, well, diamond is really hard. So it will not change the lattice structure very much. So therefore, the electron wave function will not be perturbed very much. Therefore, the energy levels will not shift by very much. So <coughs> the force sensitivity is not very high as such. <coughs> but then you can actually play little tricks. You can make a hybrid device. So you can have here a diamond with an MV center. This is good for measuring magnetic fields, but it's not so good for measuring forces. So what reacts very well what creates a lot of magnetic field by application of a small force? Well, you take a piezomagnetic material. Piezomagnetic material, you exert pressure. As a reaction, you get a magnetic field. So you can combine these two things. You put this piezomagnetic material here. 
you exert pressure and you measure the stray field that is generated at the point of the MV center. And that improves the pressure sensitivity by a factor of a thousand and the force sensitivity by a factor of a thousand. And if you do that, well, you can actually do biology again, at least in principle, that's theory. Here you have your force sensor. You attach at one end some, well, you glue basically a protein to the surface. And the protein at the other end is attached to some, yeah, AFM for example, some lever or something. And then you pull. There are many biologists that like to do this. So by pulling the protein and by learning how uh, the force curve depends on time, they can learn something about the forces that are acting when proteins are folding. And they learn about protein structure. But you can imagine this is very small forces. Yeah. And in fact, the forces that you have here are the order of piconewton. So really, really tiny. But this, this sort of mixture of a piezomagnetic material and diamond is actually able to resolve these kind of forces. So this is actually, I mean, we shifted them a little bit. This would be an experimental curve that you would like to see. And this is a simulation of the force sensor actually in action with measurement uncertainty. And so you see they go perfectly in parallel and we shifted them by on purpose so they wouldn't be normally on top. So really you can resolve, you very slowly pull and you can see the jumps in the force that you, that you have. And so you learn about protein uh, folding. Okay, so this is, these are sort of applications of kind of sensing. So now, what time is it now? Ah, perfect. So, the last bit, uh, which will not be completely half an hour, I think it will be more like 30 minutes, I would say. I'll tell you something else. Again, we will use quantum technology based on these diamonds and these MV centers to actually improve MRI imaging. So this is an MRI machine. Some of you might have been in one. Um, it's not a particular pleasure. I've not been in one myself so far, but uh, my stepfather was, for example, and he told me that it's not fun because it's very, very noisy and it's, you know, it's also very spiritually very confined. So you don't really want to be in there for very long. Uh, so it's nice to be able to accelerate, let's say, data taking here. Okay. So, um, These, these devices, I mean, they use, again, I mean, they basically use magnetic resonance. They're similar to MRI with a magnetic field gradient in addition. And they can make very nice, very sharp pictures of your body. I mean, this is, I think this is actually not from a human. I think this is from a mouse. But in any case, you really have a very high spatial resolution. It's really very nice. And that's why medics also love it. I mean, you can go inside the body and you can see with high spatial resolution what's going on there. Now, what you actually image there is hydrogen atoms. Um, which is good because the body is full of them. Um, so that's nice, but the sensitivity of this device is actually not very high. So it cannot actually see a single molecule. Yeah? Actually, it needs quite a lot of molecules. I mean, like, I mean, many millions to see them. And that, in a way, uh, um, limits the spatial resolution of this device. But that's not so much the problem, but it, it, it is not capable of following, for example, drug molecules through the body. It is not capable of seeing very, very small clusters of cancer cells, for example. And so this is a challenge that one would like to overcome. And also, if I could increase the, the sensitivity, um, I could simply reduce the measurement time so I can push shove you in and take you out more quickly, which is also welcome. Also because these devices are very expensive, so if you can use them on more patients per day, this would uh, be a big efficiency gain. So, I mean, you really you would like to do something about the sensitivity issue. And I told you already what the problem here is, actually. Because what you are measuring, again, is the, de the detector is very far away, so really you only measure the net polarization of the nuclear spins. And that is very, very small at room temperature. And there's not much one can do about that because we cannot cool you down uh, very much because this is done on the living being. 
So therefore, in, you you really have again so one out of a well, you have hundred thousand spins here or one hundred thousand here and one hundred and thousand and one down here, and the, you measure only the difference. So one out of ten to the five spins give a signal. So that's a problem. What you really would like to do is this situation where most of the spins are down here and only very few are up here, so you have a huge population difference and then each single spin will give you a signal. So then you <coughs> measure the total magnetization is simply very, very much larger. So there is somehow the potential to gain a factor of 10 to the 5, either in time or in sensitivity. So this is exactly um, what people in the last 10 years have started to aim for. Actually, they have been uh, very interested in trying to use small uh, some molecules, inject them into your body, but before they do so, to actually polarize them very, very, very strongly, yeah, to make them make all the spins align basically, so that they would give a sharper signal in this MRI machine. This is called hyperpolarization assisted MRI imaging. But the problem with that is actually that yes, one can do that, um, but it's really, really expensive because devices that uh, do this polarization cost about 2 million euros each. They use liquid helium temperatures, so they actually, the stuff that, you want to, that they want to inject into your body, it first deep frozen, then it's um, in this deep frozen state, it's polarized, and then the machines actually shoot the, the probe out up very rapidly and heat it up at the same time and it gets very warm actually often above 100 degrees for a very short time but it has to be defrosted quickly you cannot just wait half an hour until it's defrosted because then the polarization is gone again so they shoot this out heat it up and then <coughs> they, they transfer it to the place where you want to for example inject so that's not exactly a very elegant way, it's a very expensive way and also this limits the, the kind of proteins that you can actually use. Okay? Because not every protein and not every pharmaceutical compound likes to be taken to 2 Kelvin and then in, in an extremely short time be taken to almost 100 or so. Yeah. So this is really a bit limited. So there's something that you may want to do about this. So and of course, well, you know already what I'm going to use. I'm going to use these MD samples. Um, so basically, the idea or the problem is here the following. So we have 10 to the minus 8 electron volts is the energy difference between spin up and spin down of nuclear spins in any reasonable temperature. So even at 1 Kelvin temperature, which corresponds to 10 to the minus 4 electron volts, this is really indistinguishable, and the nuclear spins are essentially not polarized. Now, you could use electron, uh, forget about, ignore this here. Yeah. Um, you could use electron spins. They, in the same magnetic field, have an energy, dif en energy difference of 10 to the minus 4 electron volts, roughly, which is already exceeding a little bit the um, uh, temperature scale, uh, the energy scale at 1 Kelvin. Okay? So that means, actually, that the electron spin at that temperature will start to be polarized, just in thermal equilibrium. And that's what the current machines are using. So actually, they cool down the material, they, they first mix it with some electron spins, they cool it down, then they wait until the electron spins have thermalized, and then by some either direct processes or microwave-assisted, they transfer the electron polarization to the nuclear polarization. And then they have to wait again for a while until the electron spin has thermalized, which takes a long time at these temperatures, and they can repeat this process a few times. So, uh, as a consequence, this is also a slow process. So that's kind of okay. I mean, it's, it's good. I mean, some people actually make money with this because they build these machines and sell them. But it's really, I mean, it's a problem. We need something that works at room temperature. But at room temperature, unfortunately, the energy scale is 10 to the minus 2 electron volts, so electron spins are also completely mixed. So we need something that actually has a larger energy, energy scale. There is no spin that does that. But there's one thing that has a larger energy scale, that's visible light. So if I use a laser, 
that is a very, very pure, actually. It it's really has effectively a very low temperature, so to speak. Yeah? Because it has a very high energy difference, and at room temperature, this means that most of the photons are in one state, and so they are very pure. So what we need to do is we simply, well, simply, we need to transfer this high purity of the light onto the nuclear spins. Yeah. Or in other words, we need to suck out the entropy from those spins and somehow put them into a light field that, try, try, that takes them away. Basically. If you can do that, then you can do this polarization at room temperature. Okay. And that would open up more possible applications, would make it faster and cheaper. And so this would be nice. And well, okay, I've shown you already how to do that, actually, on one of the first slides. So, the MV center allows us to exchange energy between nuclear spins and electron spins. So that we had seen before, because that was our way of actually sensing whether there was a nuclear spin. So we know that we can do that. So that's great, but it doesn't really help us very much, because we know that this electron spin normally is quite mixed. But actually, like in atoms, if I shine laser light, I can do something which is called, is called optical pumping. So the laser light, because of selection rules, will excite to certain transitions, and then they decay. And you repeat this process by continuously shining light, and you will accumulate the electron spin in a particular m magnetic quantum number. In this case, actually, it is accumulated in this m equals zero state. So this is something that is not completely obvious. It doesn't work in every system, but it so happens that in the NV center it works. You have to really go through the entire optical structure and you look at things. So you have to take my word for it here. Shining a laser for one microsecond leaves the electron spin of the NV center polarized in 95%, even at room temperature. So you have transferred, in a way, purity from laser light to electron spin, or you have extracted entropy from the electron spin and dumped it into the laser light. So that's great, because now we have a process that in a microsecond polarizes your electron, and we have a process to exchange polarization between electron and nuclear spins. So take a small diamond, um, like this one, and make it out of carbon-13. So you grow the diamond with carbon-13. That's not a problem at all. You can just order them, actually. Also, the diamond should, of course, contain an MV center. And when it has these two things, ingredients together, then we prepare the MV center in a well-defined electron spin state. And then we exchange this state with that of the nuclear spin and make it, should make it polarized. So, now the electron spin is in a different state, so we shine a laser pulse and we polarize it again. So that takes a microsecond. And we repeat the process. So some other spin gets polarized now. We repeat the process and gradually all the nuclear spins in that diamond will become polarized. So that increases very much its magnetic moment and therefore this such a diamond will give a vastly increased signal in our MRI machine. So that's the ingredient. And so now you have to, you need chemists, actually, so that was physics, and now you need chemists and medics, actually, to help you to bring these diamonds in the right place. Fortunately, people can do this now. So Tanya Weil, for example, in, in Ulm, she's using a particular compound, a particular protein in the blood, which is called human serum albumin in some protein. I don't really know what it does, but I know that she's using it. She is unfolding it by using some whatever chemistry tricks, she can attach to it actually either drugs, anti-cancer drugs for example, but she can also attach to it labels that make this particular protein attach itself to particular surface proteins, for example, of a cancer cell. So then you take this, you put it in solution, you pour in Lots of nanodiamonds, you steal, and I'm sure you do a lot of additional tricks. 
and then this wraps itself around nano diamonds. So now you have a nano diamond wrapped with this protein, which likes to attach itself to a particular surface component of a cell, for example, a cancer cell. So that's already nice. Now you take this and you really apply these hyperpolarization procedures and you create a very strong nuclear spin polarization in this diamond at room temperature with a bit of laser light and so on and then this goes into the body and now you have here a system that has a much higher contrast in the MRI machine so while you may not be well, you, you will not be able to see a single protein you actually may be able when a few of those diamonds each with a diameter of about 100 nanometers or so attach themselves to one cell you will get a visible signal so you will be able to see that cell not actually the cell directly but you see the diamonds but because you know that they attach themselves for example to a cancer cell you know that there is a cancer cell there. and you may even be able to follow its dynamics so now this is still of course a bit of theoretical physics and a bit of um, uh, chemistry that have to be brought together but if I erase this part here, hyperpolarize the diamonds, the rest has been done already. In fact, Tanya Weil has really achieved doing all these steps here, and then diamonds are actually in a cell, they have actually entered even a cell, and here these diamonds are imaged by looking at the, res at the resonance fluorescence from the MD center. Actually. You shine a laser light and you look at the fluorescence. And you see that the diamonds are in different places, so this is the nucleus, it can't, it can't go in there for some reason. And the, but the diamonds are here, so they're in the cell now. Yeah. And the cool thing is also that what she has actually done is, she has decorated these diamonds with anti-cancer drugs, and so these diamonds actually went into a cancer cell, and inside the cancer cell there's a different pH than outside, and so this was made such that the drugs are released at a certain pH and they're released in the cell. Actually here they are not released, but here they are released and you can see this from the slight change in the frequency of their scattered light. And this then kills the cancer cell. And in some time, way in the future, this may actually be a different kind of cancer treatment. But the interesting thing here is, this is of course on the surface, this is actually not in the body, this is just a cell. And here you image it optically. You know, a big problem in chemotherapy, for example, is that you treat the patient. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. You need to take, you need to apply chemotherapy for a while until you realize that it may actually not work. In that time, you have actually poisoned your patient to some extent. So you want to find out as quickly as possible. Okay? And also, you don't want to cut off your your patient. Um, taking something out to see well, what has happened, you want to see this directly. And this, adding this hyperpolarization to the whole game here, might actually allow you to observe, do the diamonds that carry the drug go to the right place? And you observe this in real time in an MRI machine. And that might help you to, st to stop the treatment much more rapidly if it does not work, or even increase it when it seems to be working. Okay? So that's kind of a way to look at in real time at drug treatments, basically, using MRI imaging and quantum technologies and chemistry put together. Okay? Another thing that you can do with this is actually, um, this is the graph, next graph here, if a doctor, um, or if, if it's found that someone has a tumor, then it is rather important to find out whether the tumor has started to create metastas metastasis or not. Because if, if not, then you cut it out and you have a very good prognosis. If it has started to metastasize, you have to hit it with uh, chemotherapy and other things. And um, the earlier you recognize that actually the cancer has started to spread, the more effective these treatments will generally be. And currently, this is actually done by a technology called positron emission tomography, where you have markers, labels, um, that are in fact radioactive. And uh, you have basically um, 
they, they create uh, basically positron electron pairs. You detect those, and because they're going in opposite directions, uh, you can, by coincidence measurements, you can actually find out in the end where, certain, where they have been emitted from. And these materials can also, again, be functionalized such that they try and seek out, for example, cancer cells. So this is actually um, a way of finding out whether you have metastasis, cancer metastasis. Now, this is nice because it has a really, really high sensitivity. You need, very, you need to see a very small number of, of emitters to actually really see a signal. The downside is, again, rather expensive, and you really get a large dosage of, um, of radioactivity. So, in fact, you get roughly as much as the upper limit uh, permitted in a year's time of working uh, of an employee in a nuclear power plant. And this is about the largest that is tolerated for any human being. So, really a lot. And so, you cannot do this very, you shouldn't really do it very often because otherwise you start to maybe cause also cancer. So, I mean, this is great. Uh, at the moment, this is really probably the best that one has. Um, but what I've explained to you now can, of course, also be used for that. You can just try and find out whether the cancer cells have spread um, by injecting our functionalized nanodiamonds, hyperpolarized nanodiamonds, and they go through your body. If they attach themselves only here, you see a big signal from here from the MRI machine. Okay, you know this is the original tumor, that's fine. If you get signals from other places, then you know that you have to start different treatments. And that's effectively what they are doing. But of course, MRI imaging could be used for that, but it's eight orders of magnitude less sensitive, so it doesn't really work very well. With the stuff that I've explained to you, one can gain four orders of magnitude, potentially, in sensitivity because we polarize the signal, uh, the, 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 the imaging agent. And now, I told you that we make, it, make this diamond out of carbon-13 pure. So we have a very, very high uh, concentration of carbon spins. And that is better than detecting hydrogen spins because there is less carbon in your body, so you have less background. And therefore you gain again in signal. You, in the end, you gain about probably around a factor of 100,000 on top. This is, of course, theory. So but it may actually, this combination may actually make this little bit of nanotechnology and these centers electron spin polarization and so on in combination with MRI might make it as sensitive as positron emission tomography. Now, health warning here, this exists, this is, you know, under development. So we may have to slice of a few orders of magnitude here in the end, but it may still become practical because this uses only an MRI machine, no radioactive material, and it's going to be much, much, much cheaper. So, one little proof that something like this might work, we have actually, indeed, hyperpolarized diamonds in an MRI machine, uh, in, a, in, a, in an EPR machine, which we used to have a good source of microwaves. And so we had, we went to a company, actually to Bruker, which had these two machines. It was an EPR machine that provides the microwaves. We sh shone in a laser, and we had a, here a, a, a diamonds sitting in here. So we were shining in the laser light for a while, according to a certain protocol that we had developed. And then we took out the diamond, and unfortunately the NMR machine in which we wanted to now measure the signal was not right next to the APR machine. In fact, it was in a different part of the building on a different floor. So one of the experimentalists actually took the little diamond, actually put it next to a permanent magnet to Produce a, to have a little protecting field, and then they just walked for one minute to the other part of the building and put the diamond into the NMR machine. So this is highly suboptimal, obviously, um, because what you really do not want to do is you do not want to have this diamond going through a field minimum uh, into a place where the field is almost zero, because then the orientation can randomize and you lose polarization. And that's actually one thing that is happening through transport, but even worse, it happens when you take it out of the EPR machine, because this was not custom-made, it was actually taken out by hand, and this is really terrible. So, 
Um, so this was, I want to say, this is not exactly optimized. However, it shows the desired effect. So here, is the red signal is what we got from the hyperpolarized diamond. So this was um, this is taken by the NMR machine, and you get really a, a nice visible peak. Then we waited for a day uh, to allow the all the nuclear spins in that diamond to really relax the thermal equilibrium, and so we really have to wait a while because they don't couple very much with the rest of the environment. And then we did the same measurement again, same probe, same diamond measurement and then you get the blue curve. So this is what the NMR machine can possibly see normally, and this is what you see with this uh, improved measure, method. This is only about a factor of 50. It actually looks really cool, but it's only a factor of 50 improvement. We believe that a factor of 10,000 should be possible. And, well, you can imagine, cut out this 100 meters and make a custom-made device to take out the material, and you already gain a lot. Right, so... That is basically, what time is it? Yeah, spot on. So I had some you know, intricate details of quantum optics just in case I would have enough time, uh, or not, I mean, wouldn't have enough material. So the last thing I want to mention is that the same idea, so this diamond polarization, can also be used actually not only to polarize diamonds, but actually also to polarize molecules that are outside of the diamond. And so this is really what these machines that I mentioned before are doing. So they take some molecules, like pyrobots, for example, and they polarize them and then they eject them into the body. Well, we can do the same thing. We can press them with a fluid through a very small microchannel, which is filled with nanodiamonds. We shine laser light, microwaves, and so on. And here they come in unpolarized, and down here they come out polarized. And then we can take those and just inject them normally into the patient. And uh, that's another thing that we certainly want to try. And it uses all the same principles, so a bit of quantum tricks and uh, achieving polarization. Right. Okay, so with that, I want to close. So this is, these are just some applications. Um, so what I've shown you here is really a particular quantum technology. Um, these color centers of effect centers in diamond. And I've shown you how you can use those potentially to measure, I mean, not potentially, to measure magnetic fields, electric fields, forces, temperature in ambient, under ambient conditions, so at room temperature, sometimes even inside the body. I sort of raised the hope and showed you some indications that it might be realistic to actually use this to measure individual nuclear spins and perhaps learn something about the protein structures eventually. And then I've shown you a more near-term application, namely the last bit about hyperpolarization, which one might use to actually improve existing MRI imaging methods and, for example, cancer detection. And the last bit is so serious that we actually started a company to try and take this from basic ideas to hopefully the marketplace. And uh, well, with that, I would like to close. So these are the people. So this is our group. I mean, the people in blue um, are working on various aspects of ND centers. Um, and in particular, Chong Chen and uh, where is Eli Schwartz here. They work on the hyperpolarization um, part. While Roche, Casanova, and Sandy Wang, Jan Hase, Matthias Kost, uh, and at the past Andreas Albrecht, he just left the group, and, uh, are working more on the kind of the sensing aspects and also on applications of this device to quantum information processing because it might also be good for that too. And we have friends, Jan Ming Tsai and Alex Letzka, they were both ex postdocs in, in my group for uh, quite a few years. And they push the, the early developments also of these ideas. Vera is and Boris Naidenov, they are taking these theoretical ideas and turn them into actual experiments and reality. And Tanya Weil is extremely important for us, because, especially for also the last part, but also the sensing applications, because in the end, we want the diamonds to attach themselves to particular places. This requires chemistry and a lot of nifty techniques there. And she's an expert for that. And so, 
this is all collaborations uh, that are going on and in two years this will all be going on in this building that will be a new center for what we call quantum biosciences so quantum technologies applied to biological sciences and also actually a bit of quantum mechanics in biological sciences okay and now I'll stop thank you very much So the laser light itself um, has uh, is a 532 nanometer laser. Yeah. So this is sort of it doesn't have to be that, but this is a particularly convenient uh, wavelength uh, that yeah. people are using. So I'm just going back here. So then rate. Well, um, so the cooling rate um, actually. Uh, so. So there are two aspects to it. So one is how quickly can we polarize the electron spin. So I said that's about a microsecond mm -hmm. it takes. So one million times per second. But that's of course not all of it because we have to transfer to the nuclear spins. And so um, I think I actually have a graph. So let's say it will take of the order of a second to a minute to polarize the entire diamond. So I don't have a graph, it seems. Here. So, well, this is a simulation, of course. Yeah. So here we have taken one MD center and well, 548 uh, nuclear spins, carbon-13 nuclear spins. We implemented this protocol with all sorts of realistic parameters, and then you see that the degree of polarization. So this is polarization per spin here, yeah? how it's growing. So here the time scale is of the order of seconds. Um, and you, in this protocol, even at 20%, you have not saturated. But this does not take into account, for example, depolarizing events. Okay. So this is a bit optimistic, so it might actually perhaps saturate here. And the time scale may also be a little bit optimistic, so let's say it's a theory calculation, so two orders of magnitude more is a minute. Okay. Yeah. So around a minute or so, you should be able to polarize time. In the experiment that we did, we you would be shown in the laser for five minutes roughly, okay. just to be on the safe side because we didn't want to check too much, so we wanted to be sure that it has uh, saturated. And that was apparently the case because they tried to vary the things a little bit. But that's kind of the, the length scale. Right? Well, well, I mean, when we are here, we would take out the diamond and use it for imaging, then we put it in again, and then it takes again a minute or so. Okay. But, I mean, <laughs> Normally we would not take it out of the body and put it in again, we take the next batch. Okay. Yeah. And um, so this is, so it's realistic uh, to do this. The standard method takes about one and a half hours or so. So it's, it's faster. Okay. Now, there are some ingredients here that I did not uh, mention. And one is, of course, what the diamond does is it will not polarize directly all the nuclear spins in the diamond. Because, I mean, some of the, the nuclear spins are far away. At the MV center is here, and then maybe one nanometer distance or so, or one and a half nanometers, you see nuclear spins, you can exchange polarization with them. So the inner part is polarized directly, and then we have to rely on diffusion of the spin polarization. So the nuclear spins have to make flip flops and exchange polarization with each other. And that actually also limits this a little bit because. Let's say if you put two carbon-13 on neighboring lattice sites, then the interaction is, if I remember right, two kilohertz. Okay. So that is, gives you kind of the diffusion rate. Okay? So this is also a limiting factor. But that was, that was included in this calculation. So this is in here. Okay. Yeah. So that is kind of the, the answer. So, and that is probably, I mean, that, I don't think that can be made much, much faster. And now a natural question is how long does the uh, nuclear spin polarization time last? Uh, how long is the nuclear spin polarization time? Now, uh, that's not clear yet in these small diamonds. There were some measurements, 
uh, on non-optimized diamonds, and there it was about 80 seconds. However, I think I have this at the, after, at the end of the, yeah, there you go. Interestingly, it was not an exponential decay, but it was actually a depolarization <coughs> decay like e to the minus square root of t. It was not completely understood where this is coming from. Yeah, one possibility actually is that the only way, the, the, the dominant way for nuclear spins to lose polarization is on the surface of the diamond. Because in the diamond they would have to act, uh, interact um, with vibrational degrees of freedom and actually in bulk diamond nuclear spins have a lifetime of, I mean, up to days. So it must be the surface. So you have to actually, so on the surface polarization is destroyed and this entropy basically has to diffuse inwards. Now, if this diffusion maybe is not quite so effective, then, I mean, for, for example, due to some disorder or so, then it might actually lead to a square root a T behavior. But it's not really well understood actually okay. what this experiment does. But let's say it is, this already has 50 seconds according to this law, and it may well be that we can extend this by a factor of 10 or 100. It depends. That you can, uh, so if in natural, I mean, there is no typical, let's say, uh, mm. choice, you can choose this because they are made artificially. So, you, I mean, ideally you take a diamond, then you implant nitrogen in a certain concentration, then you subject the diamond to electron bombardment to, for example, to create uh, vacancies. Then uh, you heat up the diamond to, I think, uh, 700 Kelvin. That means the vacancies will start actually to remove, to diffuse. And when they sit next to a nitrogen, they're a little bit more stable and would need 800 Kelvin for, the, for them to move. And so in that way you form, in a random way, of course, nitrogen vacancy samples. But you can see that you can uh, adjust the concentration to a certain extent by um, using the right concentration of implanted nitrogen. So then it's a question of what we want here. And we maybe we want um, you know roughly an NV center, an NV and V distance, let's say, I mean maybe 10 nanometers, 20 nanometers, or something like that, of that order, so that there are not too many uh, nuclear spins uh, that are very far away from the NV center. No, I, um, uh, I mean, I, I'm not actually sure that it would be a big problem, but um, I cannot see any advantage in it. Yeah. And so therefore, it might be better not to. Um, and for that, they have to be quite close.